So good afternoon and welcome to the seventh webinar in our series. Um, this one is on pre-wiring for internet. Uh, the idea was that um, we've had to break wallboards before um, on brand new buildings, which we thought was probably not the right thing to be able to do. So um, when we went to uh, um, install internet for the customer in order to put the internet in the right places, um, we would actually have to break the wallboard to put our conduit in or put a, our access points in. So we thought that maybe there would be a good idea to uh, allow people to think a little bit about pre-wiring for internet. And the other thing was while we walked through this, um, it showed up as, as being um, something that has um, a lot of different possibilities. Um, the world of, of buildings has changed over the last 10 years. And uh, there's a lot of things going on that allow people to uh, um, work with those buildings. And, um, and from those buildings, they're, they're able to uh, um, control many, many devices. Um, so thanks for attending the webinar. Um, we're looking forward to your questions and comments. Anytime that you want to do that, you're welcome to do that. Um, hi, Mark, how are you? Um, and then we've got, um, so we, this is our seventh. Um, we did Smart Farms uh, two weeks ago. Um, we, we, this one is on pre-wiring the internet. There's, uh, there's more to come. Um, we have, uh, a lot of, a lot of things to, to, that we think customers might be interested in and we are building a library. So anybody who wants to see the library can go to, uh, storm.ca slash webinars and they'll find our library there, um, and be able to see what's going on. Um, thanks to the, uh, to, to the marketing team who puts together the slides and makes them pretty. Um, and, uh, and make sure the content flows. And uh, thanks to the team that, uh, to, that keeps uh, things going. Um, so we've been doing the, uh, the internet in the Ottawa area for more than 25 years. Um, we actually own our own facilities-based distribution, um, both using fiber and fixed wireless access. And we also do resell um, uh, DSL cable and fiber. Um, multiple fiber suppliers, multiple cable suppliers, and of course DSL is a Bell product. Um, we have our local customer service, so so um, we we run customer service here in in uh, Ottawa, um, but it all, also out of our rural offices in Perth and Chesterville. Um, so those are the, the that's the beginning of what we have. The wireless footprint is um, 262 towers. Um, it's across um, eastern Ontario all the way to the Quebec border um, and, and uh, we provide speeds of up to 100 down and, and 20 up um, and uh, that seems to be uh, what people need. The new 5020 um, has started to roll out in our area as well. So we're actually able to deliver 50 down and 20 up which allows for multiple cameras um, and uh, perhaps other devices that need to push things up um, to, to the cloud or, or to uh, other um, servers. So that's something that's new for us. And we're going to be evaluating where there's a demand for the higher up speeds and uh, making adjustments accordingly. Um, we do work for our communities. Um, we, we support events. We help municipalities with uh, uh, meeting spaces and construction, like we've done with the light rail transit uh, construction in Ottawa. We probably have eight or ten uh, sites currently that we actually um, we actually do things for, and um, and we're able to actually um, add all those things so that they can uh, th they can actually move that construction trailer a little bit further down the line and automatically. Um, we can reconnect them by just adjusting the wireless to there. We do a lot of fixed wireless access, um, and, and it's useful for uh, connections for for events as well as for um, as well as for construction, and uh, and so we're doing a lot of that. Um, we've done over 150 smart farms across the area, uh, lots of marinas and campgrounds. And in fact, campground season seems to be starting. We're getting calls from people who wanted to know a little bit about that and doing a lot of work on, on um, uh, helping 
people who located their business rurally get the internet that they need to carry on business. So manufacturing is one of those areas and distribution logistics often end up in, in the rural areas. And surprisingly enough, tourism um, is there. So we have a lot of county fairs that we help support and uh, we support from time to time, we get to support the uh, international plowing match when it comes to, to the area. And uh, we've done a couple of those, including bringing our portable tower. We have a 110 foot portable tower that we can deploy. And so we brought that to, to help the uh, internet for the merchants as well as for the gates um, to allow that kind of thing to happen. Um, so today's topic is pre-wiring for the best internet access. Um, this was put together at the suggestion of, of uh, one of our sales uh, folks who noticed that we were actually breaking drywall um, in brand new buildings. And uh, so he said, well, if we could do something about construction and probably even renovations to remind people that before you seal up the walls, it would be good to put things, in, um, the right things in the right place. And, and uh, so we're going to talk about it, but we're also going to talk a little bit about smart buildings because if you're thinking about a new building, you might be thinking about some of the devices you could connect to the internet um, because uh, you might want to take advantage of that for energy savings and and um, managing things. Uh, okay. So the first thing to understand is what are your goals? Um, you know, there are access points uh, for Wi-Fi, um, but there's also jacks. And the jacks are still important. I know everybody loves Wi-Fi because you don't have to get uh, wired to something. But if you're going to have something that's not going to move like a TV um, or, uh, or a sensor in your wall, why wouldn't you wire it? so that you don't have to pick it all up uh, wirelessly. Um, so, so think about where th those access points ought to be. Um, the Wi-Fi coverage, well, that's part of the game. Um, Wi-Fi comes in, in a, a variety of flavors, and each of the routers that are behind the Wi-Fi have different characteristics. So we find that there's um, s some of the characteristics th that uh, people don't always understand is although the router says can handle 64 um, uh, connections, uh, if you read the fine print, it often says, but 15 at a time. So while you can define 64 items, you're only going to get six, uh, 15 of them running at the same time. So it's important that you actually understand what you're looking for. Um, our team will actually help you pick a Wi-Fi that meets your application. Um, when people think about it, uh, how many devices are in, in the building? Um, they're all competing for the Wi-Fi. Um, can you stick some of the Wi-Fi stuff on, um, on a, uh, uh, a guest channel? Is there more than one guest channel available? Um, so you can get priority and non-priority um, items by using the guest channel. Um, most routers these days have a guest channel. Um, so you can have visitors that do things, but you can also decide all smartwatches log into the uh, guest channel because is it really a priority if it's a smartwatch? We don't know, but probably your TV and, yeah, and, your, and your laptops are more of a priority because um, that's where you're actually working from if you're in the building. Um, so smart buildings is a whole new thing um, for many of our customers. There's, they're looking at how they do things with building management systems. So how does the HVAC work? Um, so, so you can monitor temperatures and, and um, look to see whether a floor is occupied and turn down the, the heat or the air conditioning um, and, and save a, a bunch by doing that. Um, uh, you can get your security organized across the internet so that um, you can log when people um, come to the building and manage their FOB to find out whether whether they're currently allowed to be in the building during that time period and so on. Um, lighting, uh, there, there are a lot of uh, Wi-Fi available lights that for, um, for residential use, um, but lighting overall can be also controlled um, uh, through the internet, but wired. Um, so, so it's not uh, necessarily has to be um, uh, on Wi-Fi to do that. Um, surveillance, we have tons of customers that we've done cameras for. Um, we've even done some work for compression of cameras um, so, so, uh, so that uh, um, they get a 90% less footprint um, 
which helps with you go from seven day storage to 70 day storage that can be quite handy um, and nowadays people have digital signage digital signage in the lobby saying welcome storm internet or you know welcoming guests and and putting up uh, signs for meetings and things like that that can all be done digitally on TV or on on a uh, specifically designed uh, sign that allows you to drop messages on it um, so that you can uh, help communicate um, things um, maintenance systems uh, you can have a maintenance system that knows two things one of which is what needs to be done um, for the building like when do you have to actually go and uh, check the uh, the filters on your furnaces or your air conditioning um, you can also take a look at um, uh, the sensors um, that, that are that are there and when do they need to be how do they need to be serviced and when um, storm has 262 towers and and all of our towers get inspected um, uh, and not only do we inspect the towers, but we also look at the generators that are at the towers. In fact, the generators all run every Wednesday for about an hour to take a look to see what's going on with with those uh, with those generators. So it, it's in, we're managing them remotely and have sensors to understand um, w what uh, they are produce that particular generator is producing. So those kinds of things uh, is where IoT or Internet of Things comes in. Those sensors are important. You can think about what would you actually like to be able to monitor in your in your building or related to your building. Um, and these days, you can actually use artificial intelligence to manage the thresholds or ranges. We used to just call it an algorithm, but people want to call it artificial intelligence. Now, it takes real intelligence to manage artificial intelligence. Um, so that's something that people want to think about, like what is it that we want to manage? So temperatures is obviously one, and not everything is a nest device. Many, many of them are actually by people like Honeywell that have for years been managing buildings and the temperature range that the building would be in. Um, energy management and water management. Um, so uh, water management is kind of a new topic for a lot of places, but if you're in uh, some of the public buildings in the Ottawa area, um, like the conference center, you may notice that they actually use rainwater um, uh, to, uh, to, for the toilets. And, and uh, they, they do water management to, uh, to avoid having to use um, water from the city uh, any more than they need to. So there's a lot of things that are going on in those areas. Um, solar, uh, there's a couple of different things in the solar world. Uh, one is on uh, power, um, you know, bringing solar power in and using it to, to uh, um, perhaps feed batteries or perhaps to, to run certain things during the daytime. Um, those, those are available. Um, and then you actually take a look at um, solar for heating. It turns out that um, some of the new glass is capable of changing the way that it is to block heat out um, or to allow sunlight through. Um, and, and also solar can be used to heat hot water. So we, we, uh, we're seeing some of those kinds of systems being put in in the new buildings that are all LEEDS compliant, um, which is a standard for green buildings. Um, we also see uh, geothermal. Um, occasionally, I think you're going to see more of that because um, you can literally uh, get a 45 degree difference between under the ground and the surface temperatures. So you're going to see that. Um, many buildings have some kind of a Muzak in the lobby or in the elevators, um, but they can also be used for announcements. And sometimes the sound system is used for two way um, uh two-way conversations. So that's something to think about. Um, uh, we noticed that people are actually um, making it so they can play music on a standard sound system out on their patios. If they have a building with a patio and, and they want to have sound out there for so people can have lunch with a little bit of music in the background, they can make that happen too. So those are the kinds of things that we're seeing people um, doing so you now have to think about where do we need those wires to go to be able to make this happen and then where are the access points for the Wi-Fi to make that happen. So beyond just that, when you're making your plan, you have to think about what the media is that you're going to use to be able to um, connect everything. 
So the media uh, varies. So a lot of wire these days is 6A, um, but there's no reason if, if it fits within the spec to, not to use five or six. There's just different distances for the amount of data you can push down that. And then when you get to fiber, it's not just fiber. Um, people can use th these uh, optical measurement specs. Um, so three, four, and five are all different things. And you have to also figure out how are you doing the, the fiber? Are you putting it in a conduit? Are you putting it in wiring trays? So those kinds of questions for how you distribute the actual signal around the building on what media. Um, typically, uh, internet is used uses RJ45 jacks, and uh, those for RJ45 jacks um, uh, should be placed in uh, where you think you're going to need them. And don't forget that it's easier to place that RJ45 jack on either side of the room now than to have to break a wall and, and haul a bunch of cable over to put it on the other wall if you decide to rearrange the way you do furniture in that particular room. So thinking about the where the jack placement is going to be will be uh, an important part. Plus, you can have patch panels. Um, and uh, um, and then in addition to that, routers and switches that help things go. And then, then they can feed the access points. Um, so the big question is what needs to get hooked up? You've got your building infrastructure. You, you've got things like occupied and unoccupied as statuses. You've got, and how would you know that? Do you put a motion detector in to do that? Do you read body heat? So some places actually look for body heat. So they have thermal um, detection. So they know that there's somebody there. Um, and then there's cameras and door locks are part of security. So you could actually have door locks that that uh, are uh, locked and, and unlocked via the internet could be a could be a um, um, a Bluetooth, but it could also be um, the internet itself that does that. And uh, checking to see who's authorized and you know who this person is and how does that work. All that's um, part of part of the security side of the world. Um, we also see uh, lighting um, being being done in the building infrastructure. Um, it turns out that. One of the noisiest devices around um, is actually the, uh, the the lights that are managed by um, by Wi-Fi. So um, most of those are are residential, um, but they do um, put up tremendous amount of electronic interference. If you've ever uh, measured what's going on in in that particular area um, of your of your house, you'd see that that they were interfering with signals or your neighbor's uh, lighting might be interfering with your signals because they could be on a, on the same oh 2.4 channel which is seems to be the place where everybody puts things um you're also getting smart appliances so you're um i went to buy a dishwasher uh, a couple months ago and uh one of the options was wi-fi and the question is why um so the answer was oh well we do Wi-Fi so that we can actually help you if there's any, anything that glitches with it. We'll be able to understand and be able to, you know, get uh, get you information on how to fix that. Um, but the real reason was they wanted to be able to sell me finished dishwasher stuff, which if you go to Costco once a year, you've got your finished dishwasher stuff done for the year and you don't actually have to have somebody else ship it to you. Um, I haven't got the smart appliance in the fridge yet, but we do know that fridges do keep um, uh, shopping lists and things like that these days. So you've got to be starting to think about what are the smart appliances look like. Um, you know, just turning your oven on on your way home so that you can heat your heat your dinner. Um, that could work. Um, th things like that. So you're seeing all these appliances get internet connected. Um, are they polled or are they direct signal? Um, so if they're polling, it looks at them every you know minute, two minutes, whatever. If if they're actually direct signal, they only do something if somebody actually sends them a signal, um, and then the, uh, and that signal might be tell me your current temperature, um, or turn yourself on, or whatever. Anyway, so start thinking about what what smart appliances you might end up with in your building, um, the office building. Um, these days, many office buildings have a have a bunch of appliances that, that are old school, and the new ones are going to have smart options. So when you're thinking about revamping things and buying new appliances, you might be thinking about, um, are they going to be internet connected? And who's going to manage them? How are you going to manage them? How are you handling the uh, passwords? Please change the passwords from admin 
uh, as the user and admin as the password, please change it to something else because that's the worst thing because you could otherwise have somebody actually hack your dishwasher or your or your fridge. You could remotely turn your fridge off, which is not a good thing, especially if you have a lot of food in your freezer. Um, so uh, the estimate is that you can actually, by managing um, heating and cooling in the off hours properly um, and adjusting for occupancy and using building glass to, to uh, um, appropriately handle sun, uh, depending on the time of year, and using rainwater for your operations, all of that can actually save you 30% on your energy footprint. So that's something worth looking at because most people don't have a zero cost energy footprint. Um, so, so things to think about um, for why you want to be internet connected. Um, so when people go to pre-wire, the first thing they got to do is do a, do a design. Um, uh, so you look at your building, you discuss what the needs are, you think about the needs three to five years out because that way you can get the right wiring in place. Then you do some design work um, to put a wiring diagram together. Then you choose the cables and materials required to be able to feed all those appliances that you have today or will have down the road. Um, and you work with, with departments. So if you've got a maintenance department, the maintenance department will actually uh, do its thing. Um, it, and you've got to look at how you integrate the systems. Um, how, do you, how do you integrate the monitoring of those systems back to whoever, you know, when you want to tell someone who cares, who is that person that, that's going to care? Are you sending it to a specific smartphone? Are you sending it to a group of smartphones? Because they're all people that would care. Um, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, somebody's got to install the cables. It's not fun, um, and but you're going to need cables that are run, um, and each cable needs to be correctly labeled because five years from now, I guarantee you, you will not remember that what the blue cable has. So you you know you need to need to label them really nicely, um, and then you also go through a testing process to make sure that they they are providing the spec that you want. Um, and a large reason for wanting to do that is, is because once you cl close up the walls, you do not want to have to open them again, unless you really had to open them. Um, and then the termination points in an equipment installation comes after that. So you're, you're looking at, at, at all of this, um, you end up figuring out where the hardware is going to get amounted and what equipment, how is it going to get installed, um, uh, what kind of power does it require? What kind of grounding is required? Uh, grounding turns out to be really important. And, and in fact, um, we do things in barns and, uh, and for our towers. And so occasionally um, you uh, end up with something that, uh, that pops um, that's actually a, um, a, a GFI um, breaker that pops and, and it's because it wasn't, uh, something went and, and triggered it um, th th because the grounding wasn't even. Um, you also look at the, f uh, the uh, configuration um, uh, to understand how you, how you uh, get your system up and running and how you test it. Um, the documentation and labeling should actually be maintained so that somebody who uh, takes over the job, so when you're onboarding somebody new in the maintenance department, you'd be able to go and show them the documentation. It should be a wiki or something, so they can do that. Um, when you're finished, your uh, when you're finished figuring all this out, um, you actually do a final inspection and cleanup, and you and then most of the time it's handed off to a client because the client probably doesn't have people on staff who do the wiring. So all of that's part of the process of pre-wiring and getting it ready. Um, lots of things um, uh, for for that. Um, there's actually. Uh, um, similar things happen for homes. I, I was uh, um, going down a, a Reddit hole, which is like a rabbit hole, but different. Um, and uh, there was a fellow there that had actually done his own building um, for the house that he was building, plus the garage, and uh, had used seven kilometers of, uh, of fiber uh, in order to fiber the entire premises. And um, and give the option of that he could be on the left side or the right side of the room in most of the rooms in case he rearranged the furniture. Um, the interesting part was that that uh, um, even with that seven kilometers of fiber, he realized that he really wanted to be able to put Spotify out on the deck 
and play it over uh, across the internet uh, to good speakers on the deck because that's where they spent a lot of their summer. And so he regretted missing that as part of his checklist for how he was doing things. So, it, you know, there's there's checklists that you can find that help you with this. But if you pre-wire a building, you got to think of the various systems. you got the internet system. You've got the audio system. You, you might have video and security cameras. You might have security for door door locking and unlocking. Um, and and uh, of course, there's always the uh, the fire um, suppression and fire detection systems. So all of those um, uh, will, ha will have specs and you'll have to know what kind of cabling you need for each kind of system. So it's not an easy, e easy thing, but um, we've kind of put together a little bit of, of, of a guide on that. So um, most people are using CAT6 and CAT6A cables these days. Um, the, the, uh, the, the question is how many, um, how fast is the data that you're going to get um, coming at you? So on a CAT6, you got 10 gigs that you can push down that particular um, piece of cable but you can only go 55 meters or 150 feet um so you got to think about that it, it is the run that you're doing that long or longer um you know how do you how do you handle that where are you placing your switches um and the cat 6a uh, does things for 100 feet now you may need only one gig and it's not a problem but inside your building you're capable of pushing a lot of data around people do things with printing multiple colors um, you know, 30, 32 color um, uh, documents and things like that. And those are big files when they when they get moving. So it's useful to have more speed than less speed. Um, CAT6A improves uh, shielding. That's important because everything that's electrical um, has some form of crosstalk. And and so you're trying to avoid the interference. And, uh, and so shielded cable um, is always better than unshielded cable. Um, when you look at speaker cables, uh, you could be doing in-wall or in-ceiling speaker speakers, and there's speaker wire, which is different than than uh, um, other kinds of wiring. And uh, there's different gauges, and it depends on the distance and the longer run, and um, you know how much signal you're trying to push. Um, and so somebody who's an audio expert can help out with that. Um, the uh, you can use um, 5e and 6 so 5e is actually as far as i recall um, the one that is is um, uh, shielded cable um, or 6 so you can use it to support your your digital audio or distributing um, so if you need a paging system in your building will mary please report to the front desk um, that kind of thing you can actually get uh, you can actually push that across uh, a Cat Cat five or Cat six cable. Um, video uh, coax still works, um, but there's also HDMI cables and and um, uh, depends on the length of the run once again. So understanding how you're laying out your building, understanding how far the distances are between your current point and and the uh, the end point uh, important. Um, so it, it gets you uh, what you need, where you need it. And the fiber optic, of course, um, really handy on long distance runs because they can go a couple kilometers, generally speaking, um, to move audio and video signals if you need them. Um, uh, your security cameras, um, PoE, power over ethernet, an important piece of the world these days so that you're, you're actually producing um, a certain amount of power um, that will help run the device without having to run a separate power cable. Um, so you, you uh, often have to have to look at where that's going to be um, so that you know where the power source will be for that particular device. So there's um, lots of information on, on that. Many of the security systems are PoE. Um, then we have, uh, uh, yeah, when you're starting to do um, cabling, you also have to think about, do I want to put it in conduit? So conduit could be plastic. You've, you've probably all seen the bright orange tubes. 
um, the, the, for running cable in. So what it does is it means that the cable is separate from from the rest of the world, and it's it's a tube in which the cable sits, and so that makes it easier for people to be able to uh, um, pull the cable and uh, not get it snagged up with uh, with other things. Um, you typically will need um, a professional installer to make sure you're using the right kinds of cables and getting things um, installed properly. Um, and that's the kind of thing that, that you want to be looking at. Um, so once again, kind of an overview for a smart building. There are many things that you can hook up and, and uh, get pre-wired. And not all of them are direct internet. Um, you know, your basic automation systems, your lighting control, um, smart metering, all of those kinds of things um, are, are there. Waste management, it turns out that some of the waste companies will come when your bin gets this full, whatever this full is. It could be weight or, or, or um, it could also be uh, amount left in the, in the bin available for more waste. So they'll, they'll get a dispatch message when it gets to that level of, of fullness. Um, uh, you can also do stuff with predictive maintenance. So you know that if this particular um, fan has actually done more than 2,000 hours, it's time for somebody to go take a look at it or to replace the filter or any of those kinds of things. So you can actually do it based on the number of hours that, that uh, they, it's had on time, um, which, which is kind of handy because then you can collect those statistics and figure out how, how to uh, maintain things better. Um, and lots of renewable energy um, is uh, currently coming online, integrated into systems that monitor what it is and, uh, and help you figure out um, what you need. Um, so uh, just a simple little thing like a Tesla wall um, will provide a bunch of power for a building. Um, and, and you may even be able to sell back to the grid. So uh, those kinds of things people need to do. Um, everybody here has an, uh, has an Alexa or a Siri that works for them. Those are devices that wouldn't be on your building plan from five years ago, probably. But nowadays, why wouldn't you have an Alexa that you can say, hey, Alexa, turn up the music, or hey, Alexa, um, find an article on blank. So those kinds of things, those virtual assistants uh, are are there now, and they certainly weren't on plans five years ago, at least not my plans. Um, we also like to remind people that, that um, wireless failover is possible. So even though you have a wired building, um, one of the problems with wiring is that when, a, when the fiber meets a backhoe, um, it goes away, but our fixed wireless access that we can deliver now is up to a gig or more um, So it can be a failover for the building that you're planning on so th think of the what you're doing is you're bringing a, a signal to the building um, for, So you have internet into the building now the question is what are you going to do for a failover if, if that that particular fiber or um, or DSL fails and the answer is you could have a wireless that, that uh, backs that up and, and uh, can keep you going. So we recommend that if people are thinking about a building, they should look at their, their mean time to, to uh, um, uh, recovery of operations. Um, and if you look at your mean time to recovery operations and you put a dollar value on what's it cost us to be uh, no power or no internet um, for, for N hours, um, you can come up with a value that is used when you're doing the calculation of, of uh, the insurance value of the actual internet that, that you're working on. So that's something that people ought to be thinking about. Um, so we're recommending that once you start relying more and more on internet to run your, run your business and run your uh, um, whole operation, you should also be thinking about what's the failover if something goes bump in the night. Um, and that includes throwing generators in there. That includes thinking about the whole thing to keep your business running. So, so there is always the meantime to, um, to recovery of operations. 
Um, and that calculation is not that hard to put together. Um, you just have to know what your operation does and you have to know what it costs you to be off one hour in. in. So I like people to go and look at what's the worst time this could happen to you? What's the best time, like 2 a.m. or something, that could this could happen to you? And then what's the average? And then do things where you say one hour, one hour outage versus a four hour outage versus a two day outage. So figure all those kinds of things out. Um, because at some point you do, you're going to rely on internet and power for a lot of things. So you ought to be thinking about how that all helps your resilience. And 2024 for Storm is all about resilience. So you bring in your wireless or wired feed to the building and then you distribute it around with access points. Um, so that signal gets around the building the way you want it, but that's where you need that design. You're going to spend a bunch of time thinking about what are the current systems, what are the future systems, and putting together a plan so you can deliver that signal. Um, you're going to hear about Wi-Fi 7 over the next uh, few months, probably, if you're spending any time looking at things. Uh, Wi-Fi 7 is a spec that's coming out shortly. Um, the issue with Wi-Fi 7 is it's not completed yet. Um, but, but the other issue is, is people don't actually understand all the pieces and parts that, that come with it. So as an example, um, Tom's Hardware ran a, um, a benchmark uh, of a Wi-Fi 6E versus a Wi-Fi 7. And when the Wi-Fi 7 device was 19 feet from the... Uh, um, from the router, uh, it, it worked great. It had great numbers and it moved a lot of data really, really quickly. But the moment it got to 93 feet out, the Wi-Fi 6E um, beat that $1,500 router that's doing seven. So just because it has an, a higher number doesn't mean you're actually gonna get higher throughput. Um, so so part of this is to understand what what, are the specs on the different kinds of ways of pushing the signal around the building, understand how many devices your building is intended to support floor by floor um, so that you get an idea of how much internet you really need, um, A, to the building and then B, to the particular floors. And, and don't forget every smartwatch, every phone if it's enabled for Wi-Fi, um, every tablet, every laptop, all of those contend for your Wi-Fi. So you want to be thinking about how many devices would be active on a Wi-Fi um, in a particular floor at any given time. So part of this is understanding what's the population going to look like, what kind of tasks are people doing, and therefore what do we actually need to have in that area. Um, so we can review a Wi-Fi um, a plan, uh, a whole network plan, including Wi-Fi. Um, the, the, one of the things that we do when we look at the network review is we inventory the devices. Um, we ask you about the support plan for each. Do you have to, you know, many people have a router that they've never done a firmware upgrade on. And yet firmware upgrades happen regularly. Um, and they happen for both performance and security reasons. So why wouldn't you want to be on a, the latest security patch to make sure you're not getting uh, run over um, by somebody trying to hack you. And why wouldn't you want to have the the, the best possible um, throughput? So you you really every device needs to you have need to understand what's the plan for updating the firmware. Now some of it's automatic these days, um, and and but you have to you should know that that's happening. Um, and uh, the big thing that we do when we do this is we try to help you add up what's the maximum speed that all the devices would need at, at any given time. So what's the high watermark for all those? Because although each device might want um, two gigs, um, if it's operating on its own, it, it might not need anywhere near that um, uh, uh, during on the average of the day. So take a look at that. We'll also provide a custom support plan to help you through the process. So that's uh, part of what we do. So any questions? Brandon, any questions? No, nothing for me, thank you. Okay, Did it, was it helpful? Yes. Okay. Uh, Brandon, does that help you with any of your customers? Oh yeah, it's very useful. 
Okay, good. Work it. Can I, yeah. Can I suggest a, a topic, maybe one that, maybe one you've already kind of covered in other, other places. Um, privacy is a big concern, I think, for people. And, sure. Uh, that's okay. that's one that I, I think I'd find I'd find interesting. Everyone, everyone says, well, you know, what do you have to hide? Well, the answer is nothing. The act of being watched changes behaviors. Uh, that's you know that's that's the uh, psychological fact. So uh, you know, if we're going to be free, you have to have some some privacy at least in your own home. But yeah. the internet is not really private. It's true. Uh, the observations yeah um there'll be another webinar on march 21st we're trying to decide between the remaining 17 topics um but we'll have something up shortly and uh, we'll have another topic so you can all learn about it if you have some topic that you'd like to see us do that's uh kind of connected to um internet and and how we support it and how we uh, help people install it please let me know and we'll uh, we'll try to make sure that it gets accommodated. Um, one of the things somebody suggested yesterday was maybe it's time to do the what speed do you need um, version, which talks to how you come up with what speed do you need. So anyway, we'll we'll see. There's a lot of there's a lot of topics. Thanks very much for coming out. Uh, we appreciate it.